Hello, hello, and welcome to the May edition of Table Football Monthly. And yes, I know it's the beginning of June, so I do apologise for that. But with my poor dear lady wife uh, being in rather poor health at the moment, the main production studio went back uh, to work full tilt two weeks ago. So I have had to snatch whatever spare time I can get to put this programme together. But that's not an excuse. You're not going to be shortchanged. We've still managed to pack a lot into today's programme. After a couple of episodes looking at lightweights and heavyweights and various Subutio OO scale derivatives, we are following a couple of requests looking today at the new modern sliding players. And we'll be putting those through their paces on our Subutio challenge pitch. We also have a new product review of a fantastic cardboard grid-based game called Super Soccer endorsed by Sir Bobby Charlton that you might find rather interesting. And unbelievably, we have three new pitches that we'll be reviewing for you today. One comes from our good friends at Astro Base in Italy. It is a full-sized tournament quality FISFA approved pitch. Uh, Pete and Sandra at Subutio World have sent us their new offering, which you just have to see. And it will be the debut, the debut, the launch, of the Table Football Monthly traditional British football pitch. Now at the moment, it's only a prototype, but I hope you'll enjoy seeing that. So there's lots to look forward to. I hope you're gonna enjoy it, but in the traditional Table Football Monthly way, let's start with the prize draw for the competition we ran in our Lockdown 5 special. It's that time of the month again. It's prize draw time. So you'll recall in our uh, lockdown edition number five, I showed you four teams and asked you to tell me the fifth team in the sequence. And I am thrilled to say for the first time in many months, this one had a lot of you scratching your heads, but nevertheless, a mountain of you sent in correct answers. So here are the names of everybody in the draw. So, who were the teams and what was the link? Well, the teams were all European Cup final runners-up. We began with Inter Milan. They lost in 1967 to Celtic, the Lisbon Lions, 2-1. In 1968, a very emotional final for Samat Busby. Manchester United defeated Benfica, who played in all white, 4-1. In 1969, Ajax, at the start of their European domination, lost to AC Milan by the same score at the Bernabeu. And finally, Celtic, who denied Leeds the treble, beating them in the European Cup semi-final, lost 2-1 to Feyenoord at the San Siro in Milan. So the next one in the sequence in 1971 would have been Greek side Panathinaikos, who lost 2-0 to Ajax. So it's that moment. Now I know you think, or you're going to think, I've gone soft in the head, but this is my least favorite part of the program. Because I'm getting to know so many of you and I recognize your entries, your correct entries month after month. I'd love for you all to win, but here we go. I've got one. The winner is Ian Marks. Congratulations, Ian. You are going to win this Netcam Subutio box set. I will be in touch to get your address and to get that out to you. And to our last winner, I'm sorry for the delay, but because of the lockdown and issues I've got looking after various folk at the moment, I haven't been able to send it. They will both go out on Friday. Right, there'll be another competition later in the program. Regular viewers will know that in recent times, we have been looking at a selection of player types, fundamentally plastic OO Subutio players from 1961 to the end of the 20th century. Well, following a few requests today, we're gonna to look at the more modern sliding bases. It also gives me a chance to bring back our Subutio challenge pitch. So we're going to put some of these flat base players through their paces, but before we do, let me introduce you to them. Our five, I beg your pardon, our six contestants today are, first, B 
beautifully presented by Alan Porter, we have a 1930s Leeds United player standing atop a Raptor G2 base supplied by Stefan Korda. Number two, from Astro Base, a pro standard competition base with an Astro Base Liverpool player pegged in. Regular viewers will need no introduction to player three. He is a Zugo flat in the colours of AC Milan. Next up is a lightweight Newcastle player. I've trimmed his peg and plopped him into an Astro Base Dynamic Power Base. Sorry about the colour clash. Next to him, the former Subutio licensees, Netcam of Spain. This is their flat base player in the colours of Real Madrid. And finally, again, from Astro Base in Italy, we have their dynamic pro base with a Manchester City Astro Base figure plumbed in. Subutio never actually made a flat sliding player, certainly not under the stewardship of creator Peter Adolf or a Subutio Sports and Games. These are an evolution. Now, <clears throat> what we're gonna do because they don't spin, we're going to put them through three different tests. A sliding test, obviously, and we are going to use polish. Then we'll have a control test, because sliding is one thing, but it's not just about hitting the ball. It's about being able to slow your slide down just to make a connection. So we'll be doing a control test. And of course, with these bases, it would be remiss of us not to do a chipping test but this will not be a simple chip into the goal. We're going to use the target board so we can put these players under some proper pressure. So let's see how they perform. We'll start with the sliding test. For those of you who've seen our Subutio challenge, this will be familiar. The player simply has to slide, albeit quite a long way, and will score whatever numbered ring he lands in in the target circle. In that case, because his feet are on the line, he will have scored a three. So here we go, three attempts at the slide, no edits. Good start, we'll allow a five for that. And a three makes eight. And a three makes 11. Here we go. Feet on the line will allow a three. Oh, a five. So eight for him as well. That'll be a one. It's a nine. Okay, here we have our good friend, the Zugo Flat, in the colours of AC Milan. When I was practising, these needed a slightly firmer flick. Fell a bit short. Starts with a one. And a three makes four. Oh, an overshot at the end. Four for the Zugo flat. Next up, again from Astro Base, we have the Dynamic Power Base. Uh, now these came in a bag, these bases, so I have trimmed a Newcastle lightweight and popped him in. So sorry about the colour clash. Here we go. Falling short. I wonder if they need a slightly more powerful flick. Okay, a three on number two. Definitely needs a bit more power. And a three, six for dynamic power. Fifth is a standard Subutio flat in the colors of Real Madrid, supplied by Netcam in Spain and distributed by Paul Lamond. My expectations for this chap are quite low. Let's see. Feet on the line, benefit of the doubt with that, we'll give him a three to start. <laughs> a 
Well, he gets another three, although that was hardly a slide. So that's six after two shots. Final shot. It's fallen a bit short. OK, that was mildly wayward for the modern Subutio flat. Six points, and I think three of those were fluky. Right, our final chap is again from Astro Base on a Dynamic Pro base. The player is also Astro Base uh, in Manchester City colours. Here we go. Oh, a one, and that was quite a firm flick. We'll go firm again. One again, two. And finally, three. Five all in. After round one, our Alan Porter Leeds player on a Raptor G2 base is two points in front of the Liverpool player on a pro standard competition Astro base. Our second test is all about control. Much like the first test, it's about the slide, but the player has to make contact with the ball. Because we're looking to keep possession, and to have the ball under control, once he has touched the ball, it must not leave the target circle. Three points for each completed shot. OK, here we go with shot one. Excellent. Three points to start us off. Shot two. Ooh, desperately close. Shot three. Six points. Here we go. Three on the first shot. Excellent. Nice control. Oh, a bit short on that one. And the final one. Six scored. Okay, now our friend from Zugo. <coughs> the flat base. And the AC Milan kit. Let's see. Oh, it's a bit of a solid thump. The only issue with doing these players one after the other is they're different weights, different uh, base shapes. Oh, thought that was going to be the one. Let's go again. Yes, three. OK, next up, Astro Base. This is the Dynamic Power Base with the Subutio Lightweight player in the top. He's had his peg slightly shaved, so he'll fit. A little bit short on the first one. That's three. That won't do his score any harm. And the final one. Oh, nearly three for him. Next, we have our Sabutio Real Madrid fella from Netcam in Spain, distributed in the UK by Paul Lamond. Right, I'm finding the key to this is just hitting one side of the ball rather than hitting it full on. But let's see. Oh, just too far. It's a good attempt, though. Here we go again. Let's make that more central. Three on the second shot. It was actually quite well controlled. Six. Well, the Subutio player definitely did better on that than he did on the sliding challenge. It'd be really tempting to do it again. Okay, here we go. Oh, look how close that was. Better luck, second shot. Yes, three. And the final shot. Six. Raptor G2 maintains its two point lead over the pro standard Astro Base, bringing up the rear, another Astro Base, dynamic power on nine. 
Challenge three is all about chipping. Now, each and every one of these six players can chip the ball quite easily. What we have to do here is get the ball through one of the top tier circles on the target board. The player is not allowed to stand up against the ball, as in real gameplay, that rarely happens. So he's got to be a short way back. Three shots, three points for every successful score. Zugo up first. Top left, wow, great start. Shot two. <laughs> Top right. Come on, could this be the full house? Come on, Zugo. Straight down the middle. Come on. Oh, six points scored. Right, here's our dynamic power. Currently last. That didn't really get off the ground. Right down the middle. Neatly done. That's three, final shot. Oh, that was like a pitch and putt. Three points. Dynamic pro. Wow, there's a start. <clears throat> Ooh. Between top left and centre. Last shot. No, he didn't really get off the ground. Three scored. Right, here we go. Oh dear, oh dear. That's a beauty man not starting too well. I'll have to double check that on the replay. I'm not sure if it went in the top. Or down at the bottom. Top right, three points. Oh. <laughs> Rattled around in the hole. Right, second place man on pro standard base. <laughs> I should do this and just be sensible and aim for the middle, but I just get attracted to that top corner like a moth to a flame. Oh, got it. And he didn't go in the goal, we like that. Okay, final shot. Six would be good if he can get it. Shall I go center? No, back to that top corner. Oh, that wasn't very good. But still, we got the three. The Stefan Corder Raptor G2 base is going to finish top of the table. But let's see if we can finish with a flourish. Let's go for that top corner. Here we go. <laughs> this is a good base. They're all very good and there's not much between them. And tests like this are all about millimetres. But to be able to just place it like that it gives you such a feeling of confidence. Ooh. One more for that top corner, come on. Oh! Truth told, not much in it. The Raptor G2 started at the top and stayed at the top all the way through. Pro Standard finished second and it was the Dynamic Pro Astro Base that brought up the rear. Much as that was a very enjoyable comparison, we can't give too much credibility to the final placings because as you will have seen on all three of the challenges, any one of those players were only millimeters away from scoring an extra three, six, or even nine points, which would have changed the table considerably. So really, it was just fun to do. As I mentioned in the introduction, these are not Subutio. They are an evolution of Subutio. When Subutio was created, a key ethos of the game was spin to win. And that is the part of the game you forfeit if you want to move into the arena of these kind of players. What you will gain 
is much more predictable sliding and you can have enormous fun with their chipping capability. So if you want to go down this route, there are a couple of things to think about. Here I have two flat base players that Smithy and I have for Aston Villa and West Ham. Let me put them here. So when you see in close up, they've both been very heavily decaled and look fantastic. And we're both rather fond of them. If you're going to go down that route, make sure that you're choosing the kind of bases that can accept these transfers. The second thing to think about is that quite often you can buy the bases separately. If you do that, you want to find compatible players. Sometimes you may find you have to adjust the peg, do a little bit of shaving or even a little bit of gluing to get a good fit. Now, as I mentioned, because the sliding game is a different game to Subutio, and if you want to know how different, these are early Subutio rules. These are the Federation of International Sports Table Football Rules, which is a short novel. Now that's not to knock it. This is a different game. And if you're going to play against other people using these kind of players and following these kind of rules, then this is what you have to think about. It goes slightly beyond table football at home. In conclusion, I don't think it's worth getting too focused on the minor differences in these various draft style flat sliding bases. Much as we concluded when we looked at the heavyweight and lightweight uh, OO scale 3D figures, a basic skill in flicking tabletop football players is all you need to be able to use almost any of these figures, right from celluloid and cardboard right through to these. Then once you've practiced a bit and you've got a feel for what you're looking for, that would be the time to maybe look into the small incremental differences you'll get from each base type. Right, we're going to do a product review now, and this time it's a completely different football game. On those very rare but much appreciated quiet evenings, I have been known to lurk about on Paul Woosley's old football games web, uh, website. Many of you will uh, be aware of it, but if you're not, take a look. The address is along the bottom. Paul has got just about every tabletop football game ever created. Alongside that, he's got petrol station giveaways and various football memorabilia that will blow your mind, much of it for sale. Well, on a visit about a month ago, I saw this super soccer endorsed by the legend that is Sir Bobby Charlton. The story goes that this game was made in conjunction with his uh, Sir Bobby Charlton soccer schools, uh, which he created in the 90s to offer high class coaching to youngsters from all backgrounds, not just through football clubs, which now, of course, is a global brand. So I bought this, Paul, very quickly, threw it in a box, whacked it in the post, and it arrived. So shock number one is when you take the lid off this box, it's just what is inside. Walk this way. And here it is, a colossal cardboard football stadium. Small box, enormous stadium. This whole setup came from inside this petite little box. I have to come clean, it took me the best part of an afternoon to build it, but it's worth it. And because it took me so long, I'm fairly determined we're gonna take a slow spin around with the camera so you can see the fruits of my labors. Ostensibly, Super Soccer is a grid-based tactical football game. Now, a few editions ago, some of you may remember we looked at Soccer Craft, which for me is the ultimate grid game. In fact, it's one of the ultimate football games, full stop. This is similar in as much as the players operate on a grid, but this requires the use of dice. Two eight-sided dice, to be precise. Let's put them down here so you can see them nice and close. One is green and one is yellow and they are numbered one to eight. More of that in a moment. The players are also made out of card but slot into a plastic base and it works as a system flawlessly. Have a look at that. 
And finally, let's take a closer look at the pitch. At first sight, the hexagonal pitch markings, the bold shooting areas and the scattering of various numbers can be a little bit off-putting. But like all things, take a bit of time getting used to it and it soon makes sense. So, how do we play Sir Bobby Charlton's Super Soccer? Well, the game revolves around the use of the two eight-sided die and two scorecards. Let's take a closer look at these. For this demonstration, the Blues are at home. So we have the Blues home card. Had they been away, we'd have turned it over and had the Blues away card. The red team are away. We have their away card face up. For ease with this demonstration, let's assume that we are the home side, blue, and that we have rolled a double three. Three on the green, three on the yellow. We go down the vertical green panel, across the yellow, and where the two threes meet, we have a football, one of many on this card. And on that football are three numbers at the top, the bottom left, and the bottom right. Let's have a close up and see what they tell us. This ball here is where the two threes meet. Three on the green, three on the yellow. Now on each ball, these numbers have the same meaning. The number at the top is three, five. That means we can move three of our uh, players five spaces. That's rather useful. The number on the bottom left, which in this case is a one, is how far our player in possession can travel. And finally, here in the bottom right, four spaces, that's how far he can kick the ball, be it a pass or a shot. So let's translate those three numbers onto the pitch. The Blues are kicking from left to right and the ball is with our centre back. So let's apply the benefits that roll of the die gave us. We can move three players, five spaces, which is really helpful. Now, we don't want to throw everybody forward, just in case we lose possession. So maybe our chap here, players don't have to move in a straight line. One, two, three, four, five. So he's still on side. That's one. Maybe we'll take this player out wide. One, two, three, four, five. And let's move this chap in field. One, two, three, four, five. So already our attack is taking shape. The next benefit we were given was our player in possession can move forward one space. Well, that's rather helpful because to pass to this chap, we have one, two, three, four, five. And we were only given four spaces to pass the ball. So if we take our player move as one, we can now pass the ball four spaces and it is a perfect pass. One, two, three, four. Excellent. In Super Soccer, the players take turns. So it is the Reds roll. And as we mentioned, they are playing on their away card. Well, they have rolled a two on the yellow die and a six on the green. Two on the yellow, six on the green. We can see that the Reds have the opportunity to move three players, three spaces. Should they win the ball, the player who wins the tackle can move a further single space and pass the ball eight spaces. Right, our pesky opponent has rolled a green six and a yellow two. Now what that gives him is the right to move three players, three spaces. Well, thankfully for the Blues, they're not going to lose possession. You can see if red moves three, one, two, three, he reaches the ball, but in order to win it, he'd need to roll a four or more. So he can not only win the ball, he can move away. Just landing on the same square isn't enough. This player, one, two, three, is in the same position. So good news for the blues, we have retained possession. That means that the potential for a player with the ball to move one space and the potential to pass a ball eight squares are lost to the Reds because they simply don't have the ball. But we can still move three players, three spaces, and that means we can cover in defense. So let's go. One, two, three. One, two, three. 
One, two, three. So the Reds must be feeling pretty confident, I'd imagine, that the Blues will not penetrate that red wall. I'm sure you'll appreciate that if we do this move by move, we'll be here all day. So let's assume the Blues attack has progressed to the point we are now at. Now the Blues have just rolled three on the yellow, two on the green. They meet just here. So we can see one player can move four spaces. The man in possession can't move at all, but he can pass the ball or shoot four spaces. That enables us to move one player only four spaces. Well, conveniently, our attacking Frank Lampard style midfield player, if he moves four places forward, one, two, three, four, he's got himself in a very, very exciting scoring position. The player in possession can't move, but he can pass the ball four spaces. And that happens to be one, two, three, four. He can put the ball right at the feet of our top scoring midfielder. And it would appear the Reds are in a spot of bother. For the Reds, they desperately need an intervention or they are going to face a shot from close range. They have rolled a green five and a yellow seven. Green five across to yellow seven. One player, two spaces. If they can get the ball, the player in possession who wins a tackle can move a further two and clear it seven spaces. That would be helpful. Let's see. In truth, it's a disaster. They can only move one player, two spaces. Well, he is two spaces away, but he'd need a three or more to take the ball clear. So all he can do is block. The other two numbers that we rolled don't matter because we haven't got the ball. So there's no player in possession to move two spaces and we haven't got the ball to be able to pass it seven. Now here's the thing. In super soccer, the ball can travel through the player. It's the equivalent of lifting it. It can't travel through the keeper. So our blue player has got a shot on goal. Let's see how that works. There are three ways to score a goal in super soccer. The method that we're gonna go for now requires the roll of one die. Let's roll the green one. So our attacking midfielder, Frank Lampard, clearly no slouch in front of goal, is gonna go for it. He's in zone two and he's rolled a seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And Frank has fired in number one for the Blues. Of course, there could have been a save, there could have been a corner, there could have been a miss. So let's have a look in more detail. Lampard has received the ball just outside shooting zone one. He's in shooting zone two. There's the number there. Now, although a red defender is right in front of him, in super soccer, the ball can travel through an outfield player, not through the goalkeeper, but through an outfield player. It's the equivalent of lifting the ball. Well, with a seven on the die, Lampard fires it high and hard. One, two, three, four. With room to spare, he's hammered it into the top corner and the Blues are one up. One of the issues for a programme such as Table Football Monthly is that we don't really have the time to go into the subtle complexities of a game such as Super Soccer. What you have seen is the gist of how it works with two dice and cards. The game is fundamentally tactical and it works really well. The cardboard build is superb and the stadium adds an awful lot of atmosphere and brings additional play value to the whole setup. The only downside for me as a football man is I love the whole notion of goal mouth action, whether it's a great save, the ball coming back off the woodwork, or the net bulging with a rocket into the top corner. A game such as this can't give you that, but that's the only downside. Otherwise, it gets your brain going, it needs a bit of thought, and it's immense fun. We are going to talk pitches. 
Why, I hear you ask? Well, there are two reasons. Those of you who are regular viewers will know that a short while ago, we looked at Subicho goals right up to metal goals. More recently, we looked at the evolution of Subicho balls. We've looked at different player types all the way through from the flat and celluloid players of the 40s right up to the flat base players we were looking at earlier on. The one thing left, and probably as important as the ball, and indeed the players, is the pitch. Who doesn't want to play a game of tabletop football on a gorgeous pitch? Now, many of you will already know in the early days um, with New Footy, way back in the 20s and 30s, with Subutio when they launched in the 40s, the smallest box set didn't include a pitch. What it did include were dimensions and a piece of chalk for you to create your own pitch on an army blanket, something we here at Table Football Monthly had a go at. Admittedly, I knocked the thing together pretty quickly, but it was good enough for a decent game of table football. By the end of the 40s, Subutio was supplying a gorgeous, thick base pitch. It was a thing of beauty and something I still use occasionally today. Then, as we moved into the 60s, we got very high quality cotton pitches and they came in the box sets and ran all through the 70s. But it was in the 80s when a revolution happened. We saw our very first Astro pitch and this really was a game changer. The Astro pitch was a textured PVC back pitch that was predictable, it was high quality and it was glorious to play on. It really changed everything. Even today, Smithy and I, when we get together on a Saturday morning, we play on our original AstroTurf on the old stadium we're going to look at in a minute. In the 90s, Subutio created a nylon pitch, which was for me, certainly, a disaster. Our Subutio Challenge pitch, the one we were testing the flat sliding bases on earlier, is an example of a Subutio nylon pitch. They were cheap, they were tacky, and they were horrible to play on. Now, that's not just a personal opinion. Let me show you why. As you can see, they had threads running the full length of the pitch. If your player's base or your ball had any kind of defect, the smallest bit of plastic sticking out that wasn't lying flush, then it would catch these threads. The ball could stop dead. A player mid-spin would just stop dead. It was unplayable and I really do dislike them. Now that's not to knock the manufacturers because they had to produce box sets at prices parents were willing to pay for their kids. They couldn't put in expensive AstroTurf PVC back pitches. They couldn't put in highly expensive bays or cotton pitches. So I understand why they were there. But they did a lot of damage for the game because they are just unplayable. In the early part of this century, we started seeing privately made pitches. Subutio World, who we knew well, who we know well, worked with Enrico Tecchiati, now at Astrobase, to create Soccer 3D pitches early in the century. Very high quality pitches. Then uh, Enrico, as Astrobase and Subutio World have gone on to carry on producing pitches of very high quality with AstroTurf finished and PVC backed. And that's what you're looking at now. So that is reason one why we are talking pitches, because it will round off everything else we've discussed about playing the game of tabletop Subutio football. The other reason is, in the last few days, three different new pitches have arrived at the studio. This one from Astrobase, that is a FISTFOOT approved pitch. You might be able to see at this angle, we'll look more closely later, that it's wider and it's longer than a traditional pitch. A lush green AstroTurf with a PVC backing. There is a new pitch from Pegasus. A few weeks ago, we looked at their new pitch with the circular mowing pattern on it. This one, as you'll see now, has got the square mowing pattern on it. We'll have a little play with that in a moment. And then finally, Casting your mind back even further, you'll know we looked at Netcam Subutio's highly successful, very popular winter pitch. 
Notwithstanding, they omitted to put on one of the penalty spots. It was a beautiful looking pitch. Even if after about 50 minutes, it gets a bit tricky on the eyes. And it was innovative. That was the most important thing. And at the time I mentioned how great it would be to have someone design an old British, traditional British muddy pitch. Well, we at Table Football Monthly decided to do that. And we ran into a few problems. I spoke to Pete at the Future World, who also liked the idea. But such a pitch is impossible or very difficult to print on an Astro pitch, PVC backed Astro pitch. I spoke to Enrico at Astrobase and he said, I could print it for you, but it'll have to be on a cotton flock. Well, in for penny, in for pound, we have created the prototype. We're going to show that to you today. It's not for sale yet, but if there is sufficient interest, it will go into production in the next couple of weeks, but more of that later. So three new pitches. Let's start with the Astro Base. Just to complete the picture, we have Astro Base goals and these two teams are Astro Base standard pro based teams. And these will come up later in our competition. Here you can see the lovely grass texture and when we give it the loose thread test it's as smooth as silk. The markings are lovely, truly crisp and the wider pitch, the longer pitch gives you room either to build your diorama stadium or if you prefer to play on a tournament table plenty of arm room. And if like me your preferences move to older player types you can spin to win on this pitch as easily as on the original Astro pitch. Astro Base have done a lovely job on this pitch. It plays really well. I love the shade of green. I love the fact it's so crisp and smooth. This one is a real winner and it comes in slightly more than many pitches you'll look at, but you're getting more for your money. It comes in at around £50. It's a good one. Whilst I set about removing that Astro Base pitch and laying the new Pegasus pitch, let's take a quick break for another product review. First of all, allow me to apologise for my idiot of a co-presenter. Yes, he's right, we do finally have Tomy Super Cup Football. And once again, this is thanks to Paul Woosley at oldfootballgames.co.uk and here it is in all of its rather miniature glory. But it dawned on me when I unwrapped it that ideally this game needs to be demonstrated with two players and with Smithy due back after his long absence for the next edition. This might be just the game to get him back in shape before we allow him on a Subutio table. Now I know what you're thinking, favoritism you're thinking, what about the mildly gorgeous and equally arousing Danielle. Well, don't let it be said that I don't think equally of them both. Walk this way. I want you to know that I give a lot of thought to my two co-presenters. So looking back at some of the skills that Danielle showed at tip kick, at striker, at Casden table football, I have searched high and low to find just the right game to get her back into the flow for co-presenting Table Football Monthly. And here it is. I thought it was the ideal combination of striker and tip kick. She's gonna love it. I don't know why I'm laughing. I'm a dead man walking before Danielle mashes me to a pulp. Let's go and have a look at the new Pegasus pitch. I cannot tell you how much I am looking forward to Smithy and Danielle coming back to the programme and hopefully they'll be here for the next edition because the process of dismantling the stands, the terracing, lifting up the Astro Base pitch, relaying this one, putting everything back has left me almost too much out of breath to talk to you but it's worth it because this is the new pitch from Pegasus. 
Now, if you think back to a couple of editions ago, we demonstrated the new Pegasus pitch with the circular mowing pattern. And this one maintains the high quality. If pile is the right word for the thickness of the texture, the pile is a little bit lower than that of Astro Pitch, which makes this a slightly faster pitch, which for many of you is a good thing, but you can brush it if you want to slow it down just a little bit. Right, I think the best thing we can do is throw a couple of teams on here and see how this one reacts. I'm a long time fan of Pegasus, going back to buying the metal goals, the fiver side sets, and their fine selection of pitches. And this new pitch does nothing to change that opinion. Although it's not as long or as wide as the Fistoff approved Astro Base pitch we looked at earlier, this one will fit a lot easier on a board if you're setting up at home, which most of us do, and will allow you to put a diorama around it on a decent, side, a decent sized piece of MDF. As for playing on it, it's quite fast. And that is, I believe, because the pile, the thickness of the texture of the pitch, is lower than that on the Astro pitch. Now, a lot of you like a fast moving pitch. If you do want to adjust the speed of the pitch, you can give it a brush, but do do it carefully. As you can see, the pitch easily passes our thread test. The pitch rolled up will retail at $54.99 and is available from subutioworld.co.uk and it will need to be fixed down. However, for a further £30, that's $84.99, Subutio World will deliver the pitch already attached to a board. But otherwise, I have to say, this has been a real joy to play on. This is a rather proud moment for me. Regular viewers may remember a few months ago, we did a review of the Netcam Subutio Winter Pitch, which was very successful and sold quite well, despite a missing penalty spot. And I said at the time how great it would be if somebody was to create a traditional British muddy pitch. Well, nobody did, so I have. Now, before I go any further, I want to share with you some of the reference I used to create this design. Here we have an aerial shot of the baseball ground looking fairly green. Ellen Road from way back. Then we have Ibrox, but finally back to the baseball ground with its infamous churned up pitch. I hope you'll agree, and you're very welcome not to, that this is a fair representation of those photographs. Now, this kind of pitch at the moment is technically exceedingly difficult to create on an Astro pitch, a PVC backed Astro turf. So this is on a cotton flock and was printed for me very kindly by uh, Enrico Tecchiati at Astro Base. Now at the moment, this is a prototype and I have to say, I'm thrilled with it. This will be the first time I'll have played on it, but I'm thrilled with it. There may be one or two little changes before we go to press. But now, on that very subject, that's going to rather depend on you. I created this muddy pitch because I have wanted one since I was 11. I created one two years ago for our documentary, which I'll show you now. This was created so Smithy and I 
could have a make-believe FA Cup third round tie between Liverpool and our local village team, Churchill. And it played remarkably well. I created that Churchill Town pitch using scatter that you'll find in model shops, often used for dioramas on railways. We brushed it in, it was bobbly, it was bouncy, and we really enjoyed it. The problem was it wasn't permanent. When we lifted up the pitch, everything fell off onto the floor and had to be vacuumed up. So, <clears throat> this is the first time ever I've realized the dream of recreating that pitch. So, before we demonstrate it, out of respect to the role the baseball ground played in helping me design this, we're going to use Derby County against Arsenal away in a traditional 1970 English Division I game and see what you make of it. That worked for Gemmell, although he didn't mean it. And back again, John Radford with him. Oh, here! Radford coming across the box now. Graham is behind him! So in the last minute of the half, Bob Wilson to face Alan Hinton. It's only right and proper, we put our pitch through the thread test and there, as you can see, it's perfectly smooth. This is a good time to remind you that Table Football Monthly has never been and isn't about to become a commercial enterprise. It's not something I'm interested in doing. This particular pitch is a personal ambition that I've been fortunate enough to realise, but I am aware there may be a few of you out there who would enjoy playing your tabletop football on a pitch such as this. If so, do get in touch. If there's enough of us, I can calculate the cost of putting it together, the cost of the print run, and let you know what the final cost will be. There will only be one print run, so if you are interested, get in touch relatively quickly. Uh, <coughs> it will remain a limited edition. Right, enough of all that. I think it's competition time. Now, I'm not going to go too hard on you this month, but we've got to set a bit of a teaser, but you're going to get a couple of clues. In front of me, I have three teams. You'll see that two of them are in all white. Now, this is an English League Cup question, and I emphasise League Cup. OK, now these three sides have something in common. So what I would like to know they're in date order, starting one, two, three. What I would like to know is what they have in common in relation to the League Cup, who they played and when. What do they have in common in relation to the League Cup, who they played and when. Now, if you get that question right, let me show you what you are going to win. I think you're going to like it. The prize for the winner pulled out of the hat in the next Table Football Monthly edition are two Astro Base Soccer 3D teams. Now, as you can see from the layouts, you get 11 outfield players and a, a spare base for a kicking goalkeeper. Now, these are the standard pro competition flat bases that we showed in our challenge earlier in the programme. 
I hope you'll agree the players are beautifully finished. They're two rather splendid sets and these are the very sets you will win. So they will be sent to you from the studio here. If you're inclined to enter this month's competition, and I hope that you are, please remember the usual caveats. Answers please to the studio email address in the next couple of weeks. Please don't put your answers in the comments section under the video because they'll be deleted and they won't be entered into the draw. Now, before I go, I have two rather jolly and exciting announcements to share with you. Next month, in our next edition, you will see the return, finally, of Smithy and Danielle. And I hope you're looking forward to that as much as I am. And also, in recent editions, you'll have heard mention of Paul Woosley at oldfootballgames.co.uk several times. Well, I've been speaking to Paul and he has agreed to be a guest on the programme as soon as the pandemic uh, lockdown uh, situation is a little easier. He'll be bringing a selection of the multitude of table football games, petrol giveaways, memorabilia that he's got. And we will be putting together a special programme. And I am really looking forward to that. So that's it. I hope you remain well. We look forward to seeing you next month with the three of us. Take care. Let's set up and play.